Welcome back everyone. Today on the Joseph Carlson Show, I'm excited to jump into this episode because we're gonna be covering the upcoming earnings this week. We have a lot of companies that you'll recognize, ones that are in my portfolio, ones that you are likely invested in, giving an update this week. Because after all, it's earnings season. It has begun. It began last week with Netflix reporting their earnings and we gotta see how that turned out. Netflix did a lot of good things, a lot of good things in their earnings report. The stock is now up to $770, $770, up 10 to 11% after earnings, and another almost 1% today while the rest of the market is down. Netflix just crushed it, and it's still crushing it. It's up 65% year to date. If it keeps going, it's going to be a double in 2024. And Netflix, of course, is my largest position now. It's actually surpassed Amazon become my largest position in the story fund. An $80,000 holding with $34,000 in gains. I am incredibly bullish on this company. I have been for a long period of time. And of course, I'll be doing a full analysis of Netflix's earnings tomorrow. So if you wanna see a little bit more about Netflix and my expectations for the company over the next couple of years, just make sure you subscribe to the channel and I'll have more content on that tomorrow. But for today, we're gonna to be focusing on this week. The company's reporting earnings this week there are a few of them that are very important. Here's the list of the most popular companies reporting earnings this week. On Monday, like usual, I don't see any that I think are all that interesting. It's a lot of financial companies and banks that I don't do much with, but we get into the most exciting ones starting on Tuesday. Tuesday before market open, we have Moody's reporting earnings. Moody's is a very wide moat company, a dominant duopoly company with S&P Global. Both Moody's and S&P Global are reporting their earnings this week. Moody's is market open before Tuesday. S&P Global is market open before Thursday. I'll be covering both of these companies as they're both credit rating agencies. They're both data and analytic companies. They have quite a bit of crossover. And I'll be going over the expectations I have as both of these companies are two of my largest positions. Now, we also get into a very busy day on Wednesday. Wednesday before market open, we have Coca-Cola. So that's a big one to jump into. I'll be sharing some thoughts on another Warren Buffett holding. And then Wednesday after market close, we get the most exciting earnings of the week, the number one being Tesla. Tesla has been through a slump. The company has been flat for nearly five years. If we look back five years, it's up a lot, but that includes the gains that were made in 2020, 2019. Every day, the five-year return for Tesla is getting lower and lower, as for the past four years, it's been completely flat. Earning no money for roughly four years is a long period of time, and it seems like every earnings report is another opportunity, another time where Tesla investors are told to be patient because there's something around the corner. Is that something finally here? Is Tesla gonna wow us with these earnings? We'll be discussing in this episode. Now, of course, we have some other big names here. We have ServiceNow. This is a fast-growing SaaS company that automates a lot of processes. We have Canadian Pacific, a class one railroad. That's one of the holdings in my portfolio. We'll be looking at that one. And then of course, Thursday after market close, we have another company that's moved up the ranks. Texas Roadhouse has matured quite a bit since I started with this company. I bought it at around a $4 billion market cap. Now Texas Roadhouse has become one of the biggest winners in my portfolio. With $44,000 in gains, this is a massive position that's mostly made up of gains at this point. On top of paying a big dividend, Texas Roadhouse has just been on fire. This company's doing so well. It's another one that's up plus 50% year to date, beating out the vast majority of companies in the QQQ and the S&P 500. And this doesn't include dividends. This is another big dividend payer that's been raising its dividend over time. Can they keep it up? Well, there is some hesitancy around this one. In fact, I came across a recent analysis that was a bit bearish on Texas Roadhouse. It's by Yuval Rodham of Seeking Alpha. And he says that he's expecting a miss in revenue this quarter. So we'll be going over that research, looking at why he thinks Texas Roadhouse will miss their revenue this quarter and seeing if I agree. So we have a lot to dive into, a lot to cover. Let's go ahead and jump in. Now, starting off, I'm gonna skip Monday once again. There's not many companies there that I find interesting, but when we get into tomorrow morning, we have Moody's reporting their earnings. Now, if you're not familiar with Moody's, it's a credit rating agency. They're one of the businesses that rate the huge majority of debt issued within the US. In fact, Moody's and S&P Global combined they rate a combined 90% plus of all debt that's issued across the globe. That is just massive. The debt markets are multiples bigger than the equity markets. So they are rating an enormous amount of debt 
and they're like a toll booth. Whenever they rate debt, they charge for it. The companies that pay to have their debt rated get a lower interest rate on their debt. That's why they pay Moody's and S&P Global. So they have a very good globally dominant position, and both of these companies offer similar services. So instead of going over these separately Tuesday and Thursday, I'm gonna be covering both of these at once. Moody's earnings growth trajectory has increased over the past year as a company has ramped up its earnings per share growth. The reason that these companies are ramping up their earnings per share growth is precisely because of the ratings business. We can see that over the past year, in fact, if we zoom in a little bit here, over the past year or so, Moody's has been growing in revenue a lot, growing near 20%. But why is it, instead of declining, it's now ramping back up? When we look at the KPIs, the key performance indicators, we can see precisely why. Moody's business is roughly broken up into two halves. Both of these businesses underneath the Moody's names are wonderful businesses. One of them is Moody's Investor Services. That is the credit rating business. So if you see Moody's Investor Services, you think credit rating. What they're doing there is they're doing analysis on the credibility of different companies and companies pay to have them rated. That's all the business is. And again, you can dive into this one, but it has immense pricing power. It's very sticky. It's a super wide moat, globally dominant business that they share with S&P Global. The other half is Moody's Analytics, where they take a lot of their learnings and the data, a good portion of it, and they package it into a subscription and they sell that data to different companies. Then they also have different things that they sell. Uh, if we break up Moody's Analytics, I actually have another KPI that even breaks this down into greater detail. They have decisions and solutions, research and insights. They have in-depth data again. We're in an age of information, so they offer a lot of that as subscriptions, data and information. So it's a little bit vague, but you can also just Google these to learn about them. Each one of them, they have different packages and services that they sell that many companies find very valuable. It gives them an edge. So this is the Moody's analytics portion of the company. When we look at why Moody's is all of a sudden growing over the past year, it's not Moody's analytics. The above average growth is from the Moody's investor services. And that is because more companies are starting to issue debt once again. We all remember what happened in 2021 and 2022. The market fell as the Fed raised interest rates. They're raising interest rates to combat inflation. As interest rates went up, companies held back on issuing new debt. They didn't wanna issue debt at a higher interest rate, which makes sense. But now that a couple years have passed, companies simply have to issue more debt. They have to because they have to renew debt and they have debt that they can't pay off. So companies are now once again, starting to issue more debt. As they issue more debt, they need that debt rated. And here you have Moody's and S&P Global here to rate that debt. And that's why it's skyrocketing up, especially in the past two quarters. If we compare this again to S&P Global, you'll see something very similar. S&P Global, again, has the different revenue segments. They have a little bit more diverse of a business but one of them is ratings. When we look at just the ratings business, it makes this very clear. It went down in 2021, and it started to renew growth in 2022 as more and more companies are issuing debt. When I invest in companies like this, I'm looking for long-term secular trends, things that will continue for a long foreseeable amount of time. And one of the things that I consider with both of these companies, Moody's and S&P Global, is that companies are gonna issue debt and they're gonna issue more and more of it on a global scale. As economies and countries continue to print more cash, causing more inflation, these companies will continue to rate more debt. This is why I have both of these companies as a sizable holding in my portfolio. If we look at them here, S&P Global is a $108,000 position, $33,000 in the green. Moody's is a $50,000 position, $10,000 in the green. Both of these companies have done really well given the time period that I've invested in them. Right now, given the growth profile of these companies, the tailwinds ahead, and the fact that these companies are both trading at a reasonable valuation, I'm not too concerned about the earnings going into this week. Now, moving on, we get into Wednesday before market open, and we have Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is actually doing surprisingly well. If we look at the performance this year, it's up 17%. And their last quarter, they actually crushed earnings. They raised guidance, they had higher volumes, they raised their projections. Their increase in sales in the US was something like 20%, or it was 10% in the US, it was 20% in Mexico. They're growing sales across the world, 
and somehow they continue to do this. Coca-Cola is one of these companies that by its characteristics, it looks really good. It's a Warren Buffett holding. He's held it for a very long period of time. It's a $300 billion market cap company that generates very steady revenues. They got rid of their bottling, so they're just a very efficient, capital efficient company with very low capex investment. They're basically a licensed company that sells ingredients like syrup. They have their Coca-Cola freestyle machines, which are they're just amazing. Those freestyle machines are awesome. So Coca-Cola is a great company by all the characteristics, but every time I look at this one, I come to the same conclusion. And I, I again, I could be off saying this about Coca-Cola. So this is something that maybe, maybe it will be clipped like in 10 years later, show how wrong I was. I hope that's the case. But I just can't get over how many companies are going in to soft drinks and energy drinks and sugar drinks and milk-based drinks. All these drink companies, the competition, the competition in drinks is so fierce. I've never seen anything like it. Drink competition is one of the most fiercely competitive spaces I've ever seen. You have companies like Rockstar with Pepsi. You have Celsius. You have Red Bull. You have Monster Energy. You have Bang. The energy drinks themselves, they're just endless. I can name off 20 different energy drinks that I see in the store. On top of that, we have other companies like Starbucks that are making big changes, that have new leadership, that are centered around drinks, and many of them having a lot of caffeine, that in one way or another, people can only have so many drinks during the day. We have only so many options. People talk about there being a lot of competition in different industries, and what I see with Coca-Cola and the entire soft drink energy drink, entire drink business is it seems very competitive today. Now, Coca-Cola is unique that it's so big. It has so much brand value. It has so much distribution. They have already such a massive network effects that I believe this company can withstand the intense pressure of increased competition. I still think they'll be able to grow. I still think these earnings will be good. People are paying for the extra soda. They're paying three and four dollars for it at restaurants. They're buying the in the freestyle machines. They're buying it in fast food. So I think Coca-Cola will be fine. But when I'm looking at different industries I want to get into, different companies I want to invest in, I like to invest in ones where there's more of a concentrated market share, where there's less intense competition. There's fewer competitors that are pouring billions of dollars into building their brand. We already saw what happened to Celsius. This was another up and coming brand. Uh, it, it's still just massive. We look at the revenue growth. If we look at this on a trailing basis, check out this revenue. It's it's explosive. It's faster than most tech companies, most SaaS companies. It went from 88 million, 70 million dollars in a full year to now 1.5 billion. They seemingly came out of nowhere. They branded more towards women instead of monster energy, branding towards men. They carved out another niche and now they're another big competitor competing with the likes of Coca-Cola. So for me, I believe Coca-Cola will be fine. This isn't a gloomy take on the company. I think they're gonna continue to grow, pay their dividend, grow their earnings per share at a moderate rate, but I have to believe the level of increased competition, the amount of companies wanting to get you to drink their drink and get into the habit of consuming their product over Coca-Cola, has to put pressure on the revenue growth and pricing power of this company. So we'll see what happens with Coca-Cola. I think they're gonna be fine this quarter, but long-term, I become increasingly concerned about this industry. Moving on, we get into Tesla. The biggest earnings report of the week, by far, reporting earnings after market close on Wednesday. Let me say that I'm concerned about Tesla investors over the next year or so, and here's why. Tesla stock is one that has been flat for roughly four years. When investors look at Tesla stock, a lot of them are looking at the past gains of the company, the massive CapEx investment cycle, the ramp up in production, the enormous growth that Tesla had in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And we see that in the stock price over the past five years. On a five-year basis, Tesla's up 1,200%. So massive gains, it looks just incredible. But when you look at this stock chart, you notice that virtually all the gains, in fact, all of them, are just from 2019 to 2020. That's where all this 1100% gain came from. The stock price went from $20 per share up to $283 per share. So there's your gain. It's all right here in these two years. Since then, for the past four years, Tesla stock has been flat and down. The company has had a lot of volatility and investors have enjoyed no gains while the market in comparison has raced up while many other companies are racing up every single day. And one of the concerns I have is 
What will happen if Tesla has no gains for just another year? If Tesla goes a full year without having more gains, the company will be flat for a five-year basis. So if you race uh, 2019 to 2020, if this is gone, if we've moved to the end of 2025 and Tesla's still treading water, it's still flat, you'll be able to go to the five-year period and it will say 0% or even negative. That's going to be a toll. I think that's going to be a toll mentally and psychologically on Tesla investors. A full half a decade of no gains. What happens when people are reminded over and over again that you've been in this stock for half a decade and made no gains while the market by comparison has gone up 100% or 150%? People are earning money in different companies. That could cause a lot of people to sell out of the stock, to become a little jaded on it, a little bit uh, disappointed with the performance. When they get to that point, they might end up selling. Because when you get to a full half a decade with no gains or being in the red, investors may start to wonder why it deserves its high multiple. If it doesn't deserve the high multiple, that may cause more downward pressure. So part of the reason that I'm concerned about Tesla, especially over the next year, is just the psychology behind it. A longer stock goes without no gains, I think the harder it is to justify the high multiple. We've seen what happened with companies like Disney that once had these very bright futures, they're gonna be a major streaming competitor, they're changing their business model, and then things went south, and over the past five years, it's in the red. And this is what it looks like. This is what gets highlighted. And now nobody's excited for Disney. It's hard to get that magic back once you've lost it. The next thing that I'm concerned about with Tesla is another thing that I'm beating the drum on for a long period of time, in fact, the past four years, which is the valuation of the company. Valuation is a combination of the current multiple the company trades at combined with your projections of the future growth. But to inform the valuation, we can always look at the history of the company, where it stands right now, and where its current multiple is today. That helps us inform what's going to happen with the future of this company and what you have to assume to have happen for this company to be worth the current price. Tesla is a massive company by market cap. When we look at the market cap here, let me zoom in. It is $705 billion. $705 billion. So we're talking about a company that's three quarter of a trillion dollar market cap. So we have a very large company. The problem is they don't generate a lot of cash flow to justify that market cap today. When we look at the amount of cash flow that Tesla generates, we have it right here on a trailing 12 month basis. This is the most accurate way to view it with the current trends and what they've done over the trailing year. We look at Tesla's massive ramp up. This is the reason why the company gained in market cap and gained in stock price so much from 2017 to 2020. We saw that in the charts, but those gains have already happened. The stock is already at that price. And what we've seen for the past two years, we can see it right here. In fact, let's zoom in over just the past five years. We see free cash flows falling nearly every quarter. They go up and down on their steady downward trend. When we look at Tesla right now, over the past two years, they generated nearly $2 billion in free cash flow going back 12 months. So nearly $2 billion, 1.7. We can give them the benefit of the doubt and say they generated $2 billion. $2 billion in free cash flow for company trading at a $700 billion market cap is very, very expensive. When you look at it at the current multiples, you are implying enormous levels of growth to justify this current market cap. If we give a comparison here, I'll just compare it to a company that recently reported one of my holdings, one that I am bullish on, Netflix. Netflix is at less than half the market cap of Tesla. Netflix is at 327 billion. 327 multiplied by two is around six, uh, 660. And we have Tesla at 700. So even if we got Netflix and we somehow replicated this company, made a duplicate of it, it would still be cheaper to buy both those Netflix companies, doubling the, the valuation of it than buying Tesla today. When we look at the free cash flow that Netflix generates, this is true undiluted free cash flow. In the past year, Netflix generated $7.2 billion in free cash flow. So to put this in perspective, Tesla investors are paying double the market cap of a Netflix. Like they're buying over two Netflix companies. And as a result, what they're getting over the past 12 months is one third of the free cash flow that one Netflix generates. One Netflix generates $7 billion. If you were to double Netflix, it would generate $14 billion in free cash flow, which if we do the math means that on the current free cash flow multiple, Tesla is seven times as expensive as Netflix, seven times. Now you may say that 
Tesla and Netflix are different companies. Maybe Tesla has more growth opportunity ahead of it than Netflix. Maybe it has a greater total addressable market, right? Maybe their future investment profiles look different. What I think is true, there is an argument that Tesla could become a much bigger company potentially if some of these more grandiose visions work out. But even if we look at the current growth rates of the company, when we look at Tesla right now, the revenue growth has been flat around five quarters. It's grown 1.37% on a trailing 12-month basis over the past year. So Tesla also has very slow growth right now. The company's really not growing. Netflix, which again is seven times cheaper on a free cash flow basis, just grew 15% in revenue. It was 20% on an FX neutral basis. So on growth rates, you're paying more for a company, much more for one that has flat revenue growth. And this is why I'm concerned about the valuation of the company. It's not to be hard on Tesla investors. I'm not trying to be discouraging here. Uh, it comes across that way. But I look at the numbers. I look at what's priced in today. I look at the reality of the situation and the discrepancy between the current fundamentals and the current cash flows and metrics and growth of this company. And I see a very large chasm of where this company is right now and where it needs to be to justify its valuation. Now, they may be able to bridge the gap. They may be able to fill in that valuation with incredible explosive growth like they've done in the past, but it's difficult to pull that off. Elon did it once. He grew the company from 2017 to 2020, but it's gonna be very difficult to justify a $700 billion market cap today. This is why I believe many Tesla investors are looking to the future and these more grandiose visions of the future. Robotaxi. Tesla taking over Waymo, taking over Uber, growing their robo-taxi with the new Tesla event from Elon. You have the Tesla Optimus bot. The Tesla Optimus bot was demoed during this latest event as well. They marched out. They were partially controlled by AI, which is what Tesla said. But I think it was very clear that at least the talking was done by humans. There was humans during, during the event talking through the Tesla Optimus bot because it was a little too smooth to be AI. But that has some promise. It's incredible the degree of progress Tesla has made with the Optimus bot. So maybe there's something there in the future as well. But the point remains that Tesla needs to do something and they need to do something quick. They need to grow their revenue. Their revenue cannot remain flat and have this type of valuation. The operating margins have been on a steady march down and they're starting the bottom. So we need to see revenue growth. We need to see margin growth. We need to see real advancements towards their goal of robo-taxi. No more demos, no more events. We need to see them on the road functioning like we see with Waymo's. So Tesla has a lot to live up to right now. For me, it's, it's like it's been for the past four years. I'm too concerned about what's currently priced into the company and what Tesla has to amount to to be able to grow from here. They need to be able to amount to a lot. So for me, this is one that I firmly stay on the sidelines. I think it's gonna be a very important earnings for Tesla. They need to grow their revenue. They need to grow margins. They need to show real progress. And I'm not personally confident enough that they're gonna be able to do that to the degree necessary to justify the current valuation and market cap. Let's go ahead and move on to ServiceNow. ServiceNow is reporting its earnings at the same time of Tesla after market close on Wednesday. Now, ServiceNow is a company that I think most people have heard of, but they probably don't know much about. If we look at what the company does, basically every company is made up of processes. So if you have a big organization, you need to have process after process after process. How do you have a process for dealing with customers or sales teams or internal management, HR, you name it. It's just a bunch of processes that these companies have to deal with. And ServiceNow automates processes. That's the most basic description of the company. Now you can see that they pivoted to AI. They're along with the trends here. But what this company does is automation of different variable processes. IT operations, customers, employees, app development, you name it, they have tools to automate it. Now, this has been incredibly, uh, an incredible product for the market that sustained very fast, reliable growth. If we look at the revenue growth of ServiceNow, this is one of the revenue growth line items that looks like, well, it just frankly looks fake. It looks like it's a made up one, almost like it's a scam because of how consistent it is. Let's go ahead and take a look at it here. This is on a trailing 12 month basis. That is the revenue growth over a trailing 12 month for ServiceNow. You can see that every single quarter, I think going back to 2010, on a trailing 12-month basis, has only been an incremental increase. Every single quarter has been an incremental increase 
for at least 10 years, around 14 years now. This much growth over time, especially growing at a rate of 24% still today, obviously means that this company is gonna trade at a high multiple. Any company like this that's a SaaS company growing this fast is gonna be a little bit pricey. The company has a 55 Ford PE ratio and it trades at a 1.6% free cash flow yield and they also have a lot of stock-based comp that eats into that free cash flow they generate. When we look at the returns of the company, this year it's up 33% outperforming the S&P 500 and the QQQ. So ServiceNow investors are getting alpha from this position. And that is because of the continued fast accelerated revenue growth of the company. So ServiceNow is in that category of having high growth and high growth prospects, but trading at a very rich valuation. For that reason, I put it in a category where if I already held the stock, I'd probably still hold it. I would just hang on to it. But for me, it's not a buy today going into these earnings. Now, at the same day, on Wednesday after market close, we also have Canadian Pacific reporting earnings. Canadian Pacific is on paper a great company. It is a class one railroad with a dominant network. It goes all the way from Canada to Mexico. They have opportunities to grow and grow their free cash flow per share. Everything looks good for this blue chip company, but regardless, it has not helped out with the returns of my portfolio. My portfolio is around $280,000 in the green, uh, it's doing really well this year and over the past couple of years, it's just excelled. And there's been a lot of companies that have outperformed greatly. Companies like Costco that have crushed it. New Holding with Booking, it's already doing super well, up almost $8,500. We have other ones like Texas Roadhouse and Apple and Microsoft. We have ones like Moody's and S&P Global that are all adding to the performance, creating alpha for the portfolio. But then I have a couple, just a couple holdings that really aren't holding their weight. And Canadian Pacific is one of them. I put $33,000 or $32,000 in this company. It's only up $1,100. It's really going nowhere. And this is holding it for around a year, a little over a year. So it's been a short amount of time. Maybe this one will improve over the long term. But out of the companies in my portfolio, Canadian Pacific right now is my most likely to sell. It's a company that I could be selling over the next year, and there's a couple reasons why. First of all, if we look at Canadian Pacific, we'll bring it up here. Again, it's a great company. It trades at a reasonable valuation, a 2.5% free cash flow yield, a 21 Ford PE ratio. So you're not paying like an insane price to buy this company right now. There's not too much baked into it. The revenue growth looks good, but it looks a lot less good when you factor in the fact that they did a major acquisition. So there's a lot of dilution and debt issuance to get this revenue growth. So this is not organic revenue growth. When we look at the earnings of the company, this is another issue I have. The earnings are all over the place. The company's not growing earnings anywhere like Texas Roadhouse, Costco, Microsoft, Apple, you name it. The companies in my portfolio, most of them are growing their earnings rather fast. Canadian Pacific is in this category of trying to get this back on track. Another reason that I'm considering selling Canadian Pacific is simple opportunity cost. I don't think this company's bad. In fact, I think it's an incredibly durable, lifelong holding that you could hold without too much trouble. But there's an opportunity cost to every dollar you have invested in a company. There's typically more opportunities. When I look at the opportunities I have, the alternatives, there's other interesting companies, platform companies like Booking Holdings, companies like Uber and DoorDash, companies like Netflix and Amazon. So when I'm looking at this position, I'm always thinking if it's the best place to have my money, where I'll have the best future expected returns, and I believe I have a better track record of investing in technology companies that I'm able to do in-depth analysis on. So I also believe I could use the money probably better in other places. And that's why even though going into this earnings, I don't think there's gonna be any problems. I expect Canadian Pacific to meet most of their goals, if not exceed them. I'm not concerned about this, this earnings in particular at all but it's one that I am considering selling over the next year. We'll see what happens. Now, moving on, we get into Thursday. We've already covered S&P Global with Moody's. S&P Global is reporting Thursday before market open. And then we get to Thursday after market close, which we have a new company that made the list here. It's one of the most popular ones, which is Texas Roadhouse. This company has proven itself. The management have proven themselves. And now it's becoming one of the more recognized companies in the market because of its incredible free cash flow growth, its earnings growth, and its revenue growth. Texas Roadhouse has been highly successful. If we look at the stock chart going back year to date, 
It's up 52% this year, blowing away the indices. It's just been incredible. It's been quite the ride to be on. And again, this doesn't factor in dividends, which they pay a hefty dividend that they've been raising above 10% per year. So when you factor in the dividend, it's probably another 4 or 5% higher at this point if you factor that being reinvested. When we look at the five years, Texas Roadhouse is up 273% over the past five years. When we look at the past 10 years, it's up 563%. Fun fact, with dividends reinvested, Texas Roadhouse has outperformed Google year to date, the one year, the five year, and the 10 year. This company's outperformed Google. Its monstrous performance has been a result of its incredible operations over the past decade. It's outperformed operationally and execution-wise every casual dining restaurant. So you compare it to Olive Garden, different steakhouses, Ruth Chris. You can compare it to companies like Chili's or Red Lobster, or Cracker Barrel. Most of these companies are struggling while Texas Roadhouse is outperforming most tech companies. It's also outperforming a lot of quick service restaurants, ones even like, like Chipotle or Starbucks. It's doing just as good or better than most of those. So we look at the exceptional performance of this company and the operations of it, and it it leaves some questions here. First of all, what is powering this growth? When we look at Texas Roadhouse, there's a couple things I can look at to show you what's powering the performance of this stock. Because this isn't one that's just trading up for no reason. The stock isn't up 51% this year for no reason. When we look at the trailing 12 month revenue and we look at that over time, it paints a clear picture. This company has always consistently grown over time. We see that all the way from 2004 to 2018. We get into 2020 and they had a couple quarters where it went down, understandably. If COVID didn't happen, you can imagine that this would be a nice smooth graph to the upside. But what happened since COVID was, you'll notice that the, the revenue growth actually accelerates. It's going up at a steeper trajectory now than pre-COVID. So COVID created an instance where the strongest companies survived and they took market share from weaker companies. Because they had a low fixed costs and no long-term debt, they could sail through this period no problem, while other restaurants were going bankrupt. Then coming out of the pandemic, people started to go out to eat again. Well, of course, the companies they chose to go to were the only ones remaining open, which Texas Roadhouse was one of them. Texas Roadhouse increased their value proposition by keeping their prices low. They gained enormous amounts of same store sales foot traffic. And then of course they did very moderate two to 3% price increases, which was way below companies like McDonald's at the time, which were raising their prices enormously over this time period, earning even more customer traffic for companies like Texas Roadhouse. So their growth actually accelerated after the pandemic and they've been able to keep that up. Now, during this time period, they also open up more restaurants than analysts expected at a faster cadence than analysts expected. Their same store or weekly average sales grew faster than expected. Every part of this business continued to increase week over week. If we look at the total weekly sales, it was $158,000 per week per restaurant last quarter. Now, we look at the to-go orders alone, and that is now a $20,000 per week business. The to-go orders have been streamlined because of different operational improvements in their company. Because of the incredible operations of this company, the consistency of their food, the value proposition, the low prices, and the fact that their app works great, they have a good wait list, they have to-go ordering down to a science now, they've really pushed out great operations, great processes, and that resulted in rapid improvements in their earnings per share. You can see the effects of market share gain in this industry. Texas Roadhouse growing in their brand awareness and market share has caused the earnings per share to accelerate, to have massive jumps up. In fact, in 2022, they were earning around $4 per year in earnings per share. As of the most recent 12 months, it was $5.51. Incredible growth in earnings per share, 27% year over year. So you have a company that's growing earnings faster than most of big tech. That's why the company's outperforming most of big tech. Now, the earnings per share are expected to grow at a continued fast pace this quarter, and I think they'll hit their earnings per share target. If they miss, I believe it will be a very narrow miss. Now, while all of this has gone on, investors have started to pay attention to this company. It's getting more notice, more popularity across different forums, more videos made about it. Jim Cramer's talking about it. It's on CNBC. People are noting the fast growth of this company. And some people have said that while Texas Roadhouse's growth was good, it now has some headwinds. And in fact, 
One investor here, an analyst, Yoval Rodem, says that he's expecting a miss in revenue this quarter. Let's go ahead and take a look at why he believes Texas Roadhouse will miss this quarter. He says, I expect a miss on revenue next quarter and comp headwinds, comparable headwinds. One interesting phenomenon in investing is that good quarters become a headwind for next year's results and a bad quarter becomes a tailwind. That is because the very simple math. It's much easier to grow 10% from a low number than it is to grow 10% from a high number. In terms of comps, Texas Roadhouse enjoyed relatively easier comps in the first half of 2024 due to the timing of price increases last year, with the first increase taking place in late March. As a result, Q3 of 2024 will be the first quarter to fully overlap the price increase, which amounts to 2.2%. So there we have his argument for why Texas Roadhouse will likely miss on its revenue this quarter. In my opinion, I don't buy it. I think restaurants like Texas Roadhouse are doing so well right now. When I look at what's going on outside, just go outside, visit some Texas Roadhouses, go look at the app, go on a weekend, spend some time there on any of them across the country. People want to be outside. They want to be having social events. We are trapped inside during COVID. It wasn't a fun time period. People still have money to spend. Look at the stock market. People feel rich right now. They want to go outside and have experiences. And of course, they prioritize good experiences at good value. Texas Roadhouse offers both of that. I think their same store sales this quarter will likely be around 7%. I think they're going to come in with 5 6% growth in, in restaurant sales. I think the company will continue to gain market share from its competitors because of how streamlined the offering is. And even if they do miss in revenue, which I personally think is unlikely, I don't see that as a big deal. The company's growing its revenue quickly. Whether they miss by a percent or two doesn't really matter in the long run. We've seen so much fluctuation in revenue over time, but the growth story still remains. This company is on fire. I don't think it's lost steam yet. I'm still invested in it and I'm still holding my shares. And that's gonna be it for this busy week. If you wanna see follow-up analysis, just make sure to subscribe to the channel. That's all for now.